All right, so Steven, uh, here's the thing. Honestly, and, and I have to apologize, not an NFS expert, but um, when you say it can't be routed outside of the VPC, again, I'm assuming you mean the virtual network. Um, and I never tried it, but I'm not seeing anything that says it can't. Um, and so, you know, is, is, that's writing above TCP. So I would think there wouldn't be any problem with it because the routing is occurring at the TCP. Now, there's only, I mean, unless it's not using TCP or UDP as a protocol, but as far as I know, it does. Um, so the, the uh, routing protocols, uh, I had to make sure that I was actually uh, not muted there. Uh, so the, the protocols that, that are available to you are uh, TCP, UDP, and ICMP. And as long as it's on top of that, there's really no reason it shouldn't be able to. So I'm not sure with that. Um, that's what I was just looking up and frankly not finding anything on. Um, but again, that's kind of the rule is that that's, that's the level of the uh, virtual uh, software defined network that's networking that's happening within Azure. Uh, and I see I've got a couple other questions. Fantastic. Hang on a sec. I just want to get to, uh, yeah, um, Stephen, that would be great. Uh, because if, and I apologize, I mean, uh, honestly, I will definitely get you an answer on that. It's just that um, I'll probably have to uh, confer with my uh, Cisco brethren, which actually kind of goes to a question that's down below that. Um, now, also, as far as GRE, I know BGP is the uh, primary configuration. And uh, what I may be doing overall, Stephen, tell you, rather than me try and, and uh, you know, give you an off the cuff, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take both of those and I'm actually going to take them back. Uh, sorry, no answer on this, uh, on this session, uh, but I will take those back and confer with uh, some of my Cisco uh, experts that we have and uh, make sure that uh, we are completely uh, coming up with the right answer for you. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's funny too, because on that, we had played around with it. And quite frankly, it was really easy on my side and my Cisco people had to work much harder. Okay, so Office 365 E3 mixed with Office 365 Business and a single tenant. We will be allocating licenses by using security groups. That's a great question. Um, I always think about setting the licensing at the tenant level. Um, you're allocating licenses by a security group. That totally makes sense. And hang on, let me double check with that. There we go. Uh, the answer to that from Microsoft. Now, this is as of 2015. I do not see this having changed. But uh, the answer to that is yes. And in fact, in the, oh, that's to all panelists. That's not going to help you. Uh, all panelists and attendees. There we go. Okay, I just popped in the chat. Uh, a Microsoft answer uh, from Microsoft saying that, yes, indeed, uh, you can do exactly what you're looking to do. So that is their answer. Um, and that's, uh, that's what I'm going to go with there. I, I Honestly, I thought you could because the fact that you can uh, sort of licensing by groups. Uh, but I hadn't, uh, frankly, uh, done that. So there we go. All right. That was an easy one from anonymous attendee. Next, Casey Wood, with so much going on in the cloud, does that diminish the value of having skills and technologies uh, like Cisco, Juniper, et cetera? 100% no, it does not. Um, in fact, one of the things that, um, you know, uh, we're seeing is, I mean, there's immense value in the cloud, okay? But you know, there's also scenarios where even Greenfield, in other words, you know, you, you haven't bought anything yet. Um, it might make more sense to do certain things uh, on premises. And it really comes down to cost. And oftentimes what you will see 
and, and this is where if you're looking to be an architect, this is something that's really important to understand is that not every solution is best in the cloud, right? Um, and it, it generally comes down uh, to cost metrics. I actually, it was funny, we were walking in the neighborhood uh, a couple days ago, and I, I saw a buddy of mine that uh, uh, does a lot of work with uh, SAP, and they just moved to an all-cloud solution, and he was uh, uh, not thrilled with it because their sync servers were down or whatever. So um, I think you're good. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't put SAP in the cloud. I think that was more a matter of their, their architecture not being set up correctly. But he didn't set up the architecture, so I can say that. Uh, but I think, you know, what you're going to find going forward uh, for the foreseeable future is hybrid. Um, there are going to be some organizations that do make sense to be completely in the cloud. Um, but, you know, if, if you think about it, let's say even if you're putting your full uh, workload execution into the cloud, you know, where are your workers, right? Um, you know, do you still have an office? And as long as you still have an office, you're still going to have networking. You're still going to need to get away to have a way to get between what's on premises, your, again, at least your clients, and what's in the cloud and do so effectively, safely, uh, and efficiently. So, yes, I would say it does not diminish uh, anything. And I think, uh, I know Cisco is evolving. Uh, they're evolving their training, you know, and, um, and I'm sure Juniper is as well. All right, uh, is there any c -sharp or .NET Core courses available uh, on our platform? If not, is it scheduled for the future? So right now, um, the answer to that question is, is no. Um, it's not on the platform and it's not currently scheduled. However, what I will say is, um, you should talk to uh, one of our reps uh, and make a course request because um, <laughs> yeah, Stephen, no, same. I'm sorry, I just saw that. No, I know it works great. It was just funny that uh, uh, there was an organization, he works for a big organization, and they, they went to the cloud without architecting for the cloud, I think is what I would say happened there. Um, yeah, please, uh, please don't tell Microsoft that I said there was problems running SAP on Azure. Uh, I think they would hunt me down. Uh, but uh, thank you for that uh, from the field. Uh, so anyways, on the C-sharp, I would love uh, uh, C-sharp and .NET Core, kind of my passion. Um, I would love tinkering around, love to do a course with them. Um, and honestly, right now, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, coming out because we're, we're kind of coming not quite from a zero base of content a year ago, but pretty close to it uh, and getting the content that's going to have the most impact uh, for our students. So. Uh, if we get a lot of requests for C-sharp, I guarantee you I will put a course together personally on C-sharp because I will have fun doing it. So Jonathan, you and I are now on a mission together. Jonathan, thank you very much. I think that qualifies as hands down uh, the best uh, Q&A entry of the day right there. By the way, if any uh, questions come in in the next minute or so, uh, I am I am coffee depleted, so I need to go and get more caffeine. Be well, I probably shouldn't, but I am going to. So I will be back momentarily. Uh, just know I'm not ignoring you. All right, I am back. A uh, question there from Alejandro. Uh, yes, uh, you can. Unfortunately, it's a, a one shot deal. Um, you can get a 30 day trial account and uh, you get a $200 credit with that trial account. Now, they will take a credit card, but they just use the credit card for identification purposes. Uh, it will absolutely not charge your card. Um, and it won't charge a card at the end. You would have to expressly say you wanted to convert it to a pay-as-you-go account. Um, the, the downside of the fact that they take the credit card is that uh, once you've created a trial account, it's pretty much impossible to create another one um, because even if you use a different uh, username, a different email account, um, 
they, uh, they, they will still tag you with that credit card. At least that's been my experience. So uh, the answer is yes, 30 day, $200 credit. So uh, Dimitri, that's a really interesting question. And uh, Azure Stack is something that quite honestly, I was not thinking was, was going to really gain much traction, but uh, they're definitely evolving it to the point where I think it will. So Azure Stack is uh, an on-premises Really, it's an on-premises version of Azure is, is exactly what it is. Um, it's, it's running on the same uh, technology. Uh, it, it requires, well, it used to require absolutely massive hardware. Now they have a few different versions of it, including uh, actually a portable Azure stack, like a backpack version, which is, which is pretty awesome. But that's not really your question. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, can, what is Azure Stack again? So essentially you could take that and you could set it up and then you've got a, uh, when I say it's Azure, it is a limited version of Azure. It's based on the same API, but it, it does not have all of the features, uh, of the cloud-based Azure. Uh, but you know, a lot it does. So things like setting up virtual machines, virtual networking is going to be the same. I know many of the services, I know Azure SQL database, I believe Cosmos DB as well as storage accounts. Um, and, and I can look up and find more of the list, but you can find that relatively easily. And, uh, it is absolutely designed as multi-tenant, which means that a, um, a provider, if somebody wants to be a multi-tenant provider, their own kind of hosted cloud provider, they can do that. And it's actually built to uh, provide that capability, whether it's internal, right? You're providing that on-prem cloud capability for your own organization, or if you're looking, which I think would be kind of where you would be looking to do is find somebody who's doing it on a subscription basis. As far as checking to see um, if you're going to uh, move your load from a technology standpoint, uh, what you're going to do if if you're already in um, if you're already in Azure, for example, and maybe you're running it outside of your uh, geopolitical boundary, and you have to move it inside for uh, data sovereignty reasons, um, then you know what you're going to look at at that point is. Um, you know, the feature compatibility, right? Are you using something in Azure cloud that is not available in Azure stack? And um, I can look that up really quickly. I know they've got uh, documentation on, on what the limitations are Azure stack versus Azure cloud, um, you know, but that's, that's really from, again, from a technology standpoint, that's what you need to look at. I think, frankly, the bigger issue, if you're looking at that, is the general trustworthiness of the hosting organization. And by that, I don't mean whether or not they're gonna, you know, uh, take your check and run, uh, but do they have uh, truly sufficient uh, security and uh, both physical and, you know, logical security set up within their data center uh, beyond and outside of uh, Azure Stack itself, right? Do they have the right controls in place? Uh, do they have sufficient hardware uh, to provide reliability and what kind of SLAs are they going to give you, right? Because as soon as you're looking at that kind of architecture, you're no longer looking at, you know, the overall uh, Azure data centers and the global set of data centers that are available and all the geo things you can do within Azure. You're looking at whatever uh, that hosting company can provide. Uh, so the answer is yes, you can do it. Uh, make sure that Azure Stack has the capabilities that are going to support uh, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, and then third, uh, you know, just make sure, again, I, I think uh, the word I like to use is, is a uh, trustworthy provider, okay? uh, someone that is worthy of you putting their trust in them uh, to run your workloads. By the way, I just put a uh, kind of a quick answer link. Uh, this is from their marketing stuff, uh, but this is uh, what are the the key uh, 
services that are currently available uh, in Azure Stack. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm look documentation and see if I can get a, uh, a bit of a better definition. There we go. Never mind what I just put in. You want to see the actual comparison? That was actually what I was looking for. If I have chosen the Europe zone for Office 365, does that suffice in order to be covered by GDPR regulations? Actually, uh, should be covered by GDPR. And again, understand this will be as far as the provider is concerned, right? Anytime you're talking about uh, regulatory compliance, there's two sides to that. There's what the, um, what the provider is responsible for, right? Um, and then there, of course, is what the subscriber is responsible for. So in other words, if, if you um, behave badly, if you will, if your company does, then you know that's, that's not on Microsoft. But uh, let me pull up the documentation. I'll put a link for the GDPR documentation uh, in your, uh, in the chat. Again, the big thing is that it, it's pretty much all GDPR compliant, uh, but, you know, for data sovereignty, uh, that I probably that's the, uh, uh, you know, kind of more what you're looking for. So give me just a minute, I'll pull up. There's actually really good compliance documentation from Microsoft. It's really easy to follow and I'll pull up the GDPR for it. All right. Um, regarding GDPR and Office 365, again, the, the simple thing is, the, the simple answer is yes, uh, but I think that's probably too simplistic of an answer. There's a good FAQ uh, on Microsoft's GDPR page uh, that goes into a number of the, uh, you know, number of, of common questions regarding that. And I, I think that'll give you a good uh, wide ranging answer. All right. Um, the next question, why does Microsoft require a public IP address for a virtual network gateway that is used for private networking only? Uh, for example, connecting to an express route with private peering. Okay. So, you're using, I, you know what? Here's the thing. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I, it's, uh, Ram, uh, quite frankly, it should not. Um, and and th that's really the best answer that I can give you. I think it's a matter of the virtual network gateway has been around for so long and it's so solid that maybe they've just, you know, we don't want to change this. Now, my hope would be, Ram, and well, oh, there's a couple things. First of all, I will tell you, if you're using a VNG and, you know, you're using uh, it, I assume you're talking about using it for VPN, or no, actually, I guess just as an express route um, endpoint. Um, I mean, I... I, I can see to an extent where logically, because you're dealing with all kinds of different providers that you need some way of just saying, okay, fine, this provider is going to be able to connect to it. Um, I will say just because it's got a public IP address doesn't mean that it's publicly accessible, right? So if you didn't set up any connection with that, it's not going to be publicly accessible. Um, and I would assume if you were setting up a VPN over express route, that's going to be smart enough that that's not going to be publicly exposed. And one thing that'll be interesting, I mean, I, by the way, fully agree with you. Um, but also, you know, consider that all of the, I, I say I fully agree with you. I fully agree with you in questioning why that has to be the case. Um, again, it's going to have to have a, a, an IP address, right? Uh, that's addressable uh, by the other side, one way or the other. Um, and, 
yeah, I don't know. I really can't give you a better answer than that. Sorry. Then yeah, that's, that's not necessarily pr primo. Um, I will say one thing that will be interesting to keep an eye on that may not be the case forever because what Microsoft is doing with service endpoints and the fact that we now have private service endpoints actually solves that problem. Uh, and it solves that problem explicitly uh, for some of their services. So uh, let's see what I know, SQL, um, data storage account, I think Cosmos DB and several others now have private uh, service endpoints. So now, whereas uh, up until that time, which is within the last year or so, uh, you know, if you had a uh, a service, any service, right, platform as a service, PaaS service uh, in Azure, it was going to have a public IP address. You might be able to put some firewall on it, but it had it. Uh, now you can set it up so that it actually only has a private IP address. So, you know, that may be something that either A, uh, they're looking to get to, or B, they consider it not to be a real issue because they're not routing that outside of their data center, regardless of what the address is, if, if you're going over uh, express route.